Hello and welcome to The Wicked Ones. This is Jen. And this is Tara. What's hey. going on? Hi, how hey. are you? Good, good. How's your week? Yeah, it's been, it's been good. Felt yeah. very fast. Can't imagine. They just keep flying by. I know, right? <laughs> Anything going on this week? No, no, just trying to get, you know, everything back in line with school and, you know, all the things that we now have to get back into. Yeah. I feel like it's really hard after, you know. Winter break. Yeah. yeah. What about you? Uh, well, let's see this week. Well, I'm working a lot this week, but we have to get Julia to the dentist for oh, her broken tooth, yeah. so I might be, uh, enlisting your help to take her to the dentist. And then... I got you. <laughs> <laughs> well, today, Stella goes, I think it's growing back. Like, she was trying to make Julie feel better. And I'm like, no, Julie, it's, it's definitely still broken. But, and then I also, uh, this week I get my second round of the COVID vaccine. So after Wednesday, um, I'm officially vaccinated. So Yay. that's exciting. It is exciting. So it's a big week for us. Yes. Yes. That's awesome. That's huge. I'm so proud it of you. Is. You're like doing your part to help end this thing. Thank you. It, yeah. was, it was a difficult decision, but if it's the one thing I can do. Yeah. Well, I mean. At the end of this. If people know a little bit about you by now and they've been listening, then they know your, you know, your heart belongs in science and you have done your due diligence and research and you've talked to a lot of doctors you trusted. And Absolutely. I hope, and I'm not pushing it and this isn't political, but. I hope you realize how hard the people behind this vaccine worked. Mm -hmm. I know it feels rushed, but these people worked around the clock. Around the clock. They did what needs to happen in years in a short amount of time. Not rushed, because that sounds bad. They did the work, but they just worked so freaking hard. Mm -hmm. They made it happen that fast. Yeah. But, you know, I'll keep you posted if I grow another arm. I'll yeah. let you know. Yeah. I could use one, help around yeah. the house, get the dishes done. But if you see the hashtag no bells palsy here, <laughs> you can celebrate with us. But yeah, I'm I'm confident. I uh, I'm, we joke, I'm really excited yeah. that you know, I'm I'm gonna keep my patients safe and yeah, my family safe. Absolutely. Do my part to get these you kids say, back right? in school. Oh, God, we please. need these restaurants to open and yes. we need to see yes. know, our Speaking old people which, need help. This is off on a tangent a little bit, people, but did you see what the what Barstool Sports is doing? No. Oh, I just love it. I love it. I didn't see anything. Oh yeah. I was I haven't been on social media much. I just popped on a minute ago. Oh Philly showed it talking. to me. He's yeah. He it's it's amazing what they're doing there. Uh they they have a fund now that you can donate to and it's going directly to the restaurant owners and the people who really need it. And they're sharing their stories on the website. Oh, that's and so it's, great. Oh, I listened to a few and I was crying. It's so... Oh. These owners, I mean, because you know why? People can go, oh yeah, that, that really sucks. We're, we're shutting down. And the, you don't you don't realize the scope of what is happening in the people that are suffering no. until you put a face with a story and you hear from the heart a restaurant owner who has shut down and he's worried about getting fined because he wants to keep his restaurant open because he's basically feeding the the neighborhoods and the children in the area for free. And if he gets fined and he has to shut down, he can't do that anymore. So he's complying because he his heart is in the right place and he's trying to help these other people who need him to stay open That's and crazy. to give to give really like crazy good. No, I Yeah. It's awesome. We have so, to get these restaurants open. We have we to do. get these small businesses open. They can't I mean it's we're going on a year here they're not we have it's not enough. we have to I know. we need to do this it's not enough but it we all need help. to do our part yes mm -hmm. no we all yeah. need to do our part yeah. agree agree and if that's what it is yeah then we'll do it, it you got so it. so we're continuing our like our transformation right new you mm -hmm. yes yes the new year new you and like i said the the story that you did last week um oh my gosh i saw so much of it's just it's just power right it's just when you Ego and power and getting into a position and not and not using that power for good and directing it in a way that we, these some of these people that are doing these things, they just they seem like they don't appreciate that huge responsibility 
that they are given when somebody puts their trust in them. And that's kind of continuing that theme this week. So for my transformational story, I am going to tell you about one of the fallen leaders of the self-help movement who was ultimately responsible for three very tragic deaths that could have and should have been prevented. Do you know what story I'm going to tell you or no? I don't. You don't? Not yet. I'm going to tell you about James Arthur Ray and the lives lost at the the Angel Valley Spiritual Retreat, which is a ranch near Sedona, Arizona. I don't know this one, I don't think. Ah, well. I'm excited. I am excited that you don't know it, because usually I'm like, oh boy, hopefully you find a couple things in here, but. I feel like this one, this this topic is a little different for us. Like I said, I didn't know anything about Bikram Yoga, so I feel like this is. But this I'm glad good... that I do know more about it just because, just like I said, awareness. It never hurts to be aware of what's going on. Yeah, I like this topic. Yeah. So um, the retreat in Arizona is is one that uh, James Arthur Ray would call the Spiritual Warrior Retreat. And it took place on October 8th, 2009, which is odd because that's my brother and my mom's birthday, actually. October 8th, mm-hmm. born on the same day. And I, again, I chose this story because self-awareness and self-improvement is something that nearly everyone seeks at some point in their lives, right? We talk about this. It just makes sense. We're all constantly learning and growing and trying to do better, be healthier, exercise more. Everyone's trying to find that elusive balance, you know, between life, work, family, self-care. It's it's a constant struggle. No one's perfect. And I feel like the one thing that we all have in common as human beings is that we we all have a list of things that we want to improve. Right. Yeah, I feel more now than ever. Mm-hmm. There's that. Especially I feel, now. I feel like that's a huge yeah. wave. I don't want to call it a wave, but and it's not necessarily trendy, but it's definitely either I just stumbled upon it or it just became big because mm-hmm. I feel like it's in my face constantly. You mean like self-help? Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like I agree. I feel like they talk about it in some of the things that I researched in terms of, oh, it blew up back in, you know, 2008 or 9 I can't even remember what year they said it was like bigger but it was probably when what the film comes out that I that I'm going to tell you about but I feel like it's still big I feel like I'm still constantly seeing all these I feel like the people people our age are big right now the people like most of the faces that are popular right now are in our age group yeah so maybe that's why we're hearing about it more yeah I don't know if like different you're right different age groups are necessarily paying attention like like we have been yeah but it's upsetting that there are so many people out there that are willing to take advantage of this fact I mean the fact that they know there's there's always going to be people that are buying what they're selling right Mm -hmm. I mean unfortunately during my research I found out that self-help is approximately an 11 billion dollar industry oh I believe that right people are gonna buy anything to try to make themselves feel better 100 it's actually kind of sad it is it is sad And unfortunately, it's unregulated. Many of the people out there promoting themselves have no training, no certification. They aren't licensed professionals, but they're offering advice and selling books and seminars and workshops. And faking it till you make it. And faking it till you make it. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anyone that is willing to write a check because they have been resourceful, right? They have the look people want. They're able to package, you know, what they're selling. They're charismatic. They're well-liked. People tend to trust and follow those kinds of people because... Oh, you know this makes me hot. Right? Like, I'm like, ah! <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're going to get hotter. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, and, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's also many wonderful people in the self-help. And, like, Tony Robbins comes to mind. People like... Oh, he's wonderful. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah. There's a lot of really good people out there that are trained and they are licensed and they do have your best interest at heart, but... Okay, so I know this is like a total side note, and I've discovered recently why I don't like those type of podcasts. Oh, why? They're always trying to sell you something. This is true. No one can do a podcast that's of mindfulness or positivity or, you know, any of these self without sign up for my nine-week seminar, buy my journal, Mm -hmm. do this, sign up for my... No, no, it's not everything. Is, that's why I don't like it. Mm-hmm. Because you, just you can't, can't just give tell. me the information right here. You're always, it's right. always a gimmick. It's always a sales pitch. Yeah. Yeah. You can't tell who's genuine from people no. who, you know what I mean? Because yeah. mm-hmm. I get that that's your business. So you need to make a dollar. 
but it's really but it's hard heavy. to differentiate. It's heavy on the sales pitch. Yeah. It's not it's not little, it's heavy. It, it yeah. doesn't feel genuine. I, that was a recent I, I meant to tell you about that, sorry. No, but I agree with you on that. I mean, but I never really thought about it until you really until you brought it up. Mm-hmm. But very true. Okay, sorry. No, that's okay. Um yeah, and I mean again, I I just wanted to bring awareness on the subject because these cult like organizations are out there. I mean, we're hearing about it more and more now. It's like a big deal. I mean, even Oxygen was doing a cool thing on cults, right? Mm. Deadly cults. Um, yeah, I mean, we had to check that show out, right? I think there's, I don't know when it aired. I was reading about it. And it was like in Deadly Cults, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we need oh, to wow. see this. Yeah. Because what was that one? Nick, how do you pronounce it? The N X. Oh. Like, I know what you're talking about. I don't know how to say it either. Yeah, that's on the tip of my tongue. But they did like a whole. I don't know if it was Oxygen, but somebody did a documentary on it, and it was. I Very eye opening really from what I understand. I haven't yeah. seen it. It's time for our next snack day. Yeah, yeah. Oh god, we have such a list. But yeah, I mean, these people are—they're just—they're—they're they're normal people like you and I. And I don't—I don't think anybody wakes up one day and is just like, "I think I want to join a cult," right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they just find—they wake up one day and they're like, "Holy shit, I'm in a cult." Yep. You know what I mean? They just—they don't even realize it because they're like so deep into what they're doing, and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden they're like. Yeah, they didn't sign up for it knowingly. No, no, exactly. So to get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about James Arthur Ray, his background, and how he was able to reach such a high status in the self-help community. Because I, there were, I was listening to one podcast, and I was doing some research in some other areas, and one thing that I noticed in the comments section was a lot of people were upset that they didn't get a background. Like, they didn't get enough information on what, who, who was this guy. Mm-hmm. So I went ahead and I wanted to dive into that first. So James James Arthur Ray was born in Honolulu on November 22nd, 1957, and soon after he was born, his father was discharged from the Navy and moved his family first to Iowa, then to Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is where they ended up settling. Uh, His father became a Protestant minister at the Red Fork Church of God, and his mom worked at home. It didn't say what she did exactly. I'm guessing she was probably a stay-at-home mom and probably had duties within the church, you know? Do we know what he did in the Air Force? Did you said Air Force, huh? It said the Navy, Navy. and it, it didn't say. Mm-hmm. But I feel like going from a military career to being... Oh, to being, yeah, like if maybe he was in some kind of... Maybe he wasn't a minister ministry of in some sort the there. Navy. Okay, yeah. it could have been. I was curious. It didn't, it didn't really say, and I didn't really dive back into, mm-hmm. you know, what he did. I was just but, curious. No, that's okay. Um, So Ray often talks about growing up being really poor. Yeah, he claimed that and this is a quote from one of his books, um, Harmonic Wealth. In his book, um, Harmonic Wealth, it says, the hardest part of my childhood was reconciling how dad poured his heart into his work, how he helped so many people, and yet he couldn't afford to pay for haircuts for me and my brother. So that was like one of the things that So he... this is the, the angry pastor's son. Yes. Yeah. I mean, his mom would give him haircuts. I think about it, and I'm like, oh, I'm giving... I do that too. <laughs> yeah. But it's common mm-hmm. where a pastor or minister's children are very angry at them because they feel like they've given all of their energy to their... To other people. Yeah. And they don't have anything left to give yeah. to their own family. Yeah. It's very common. Yeah. So this is, this is exactly that story. You're right. This is one of those. Um, so he also talks about how he remembers you know, sitting in church. Obviously, I'm sure they had to go every Sunday. Mm -hmm. They had to be there. Um, He remembers listening to his father preach, and that was when he heard the saying, everybody knows it, right? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So this is something that everyone's probably heard of. And it just, it struck a nerve. You know, this is something that he, that would stay with him for, for the rest of his life. It's, it made him question their family situation, and he questioned God. And he was wondering how he could allow them to be so poor that they couldn't afford nice things or even own a home. And he started to believe that it was a sin to be poor, right? And that would just, that's how he felt throughout his life. So, I mean, from what I read, they, they lived in a home, but it was next to the church. So I'm sure it was like the church's home the church's for home. the, you know, for mm-hmm. the family. He also describes himself as the kid with the Coke bottle glasses and the buck teeth. Which immediately, you know, me in movies, immediately makes me think of the character Squints Palidorus yeah. from The Sandlot, yeah, I right? Know. That's exactly who I thought it was. Is that what popped into your head? I totally picture him. And he was such a cute kid, but um, but Ray claims that he was that kid. He was gangly and nerdy, and, you know, people made fun of him all the time at school. However, 
as it is with people who fake it till you make it. Some of these things from his published books seem to range from half-truths and embellished stories to pretty much just outright lies. Yeah. Right? Well, we know that. Oh, yeah. We know that So story. he was an embellisher as well. A classmate of Ray's uh, recalled, however, that Ray always dressed well, that he was very confident, and he knew he'd make something of himself one day. So it didn't sound like he was really this kid that he portrayed himself to be. But, you know. In his mind, he was some poor, just, yeah. Or he wanted his audience to see how he overcame all of these things, right? Mm-hmm. He also said that, sure, Ray was poor, but it depends on your perspective. He claimed that Ray's father made more than his own family made, so it's all relative, right? Yeah. After high school, in 1976, he attended a local college but dropped out his junior year and instead started working at AT AT&T. He started as a telemarketer but later moved up into roles in sales, management, and training. In 1985, at 26, Ray married the first woman he ever slept with. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. He claims that he did so out of guilt and shame. He felt that if he didn't make it official, he would go to hell. Oh, that's so sad. Isn't that sad? It's not even like a high school sweetheart. It's just someone he hooked up with and then felt like he had to marry her. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, that's probably not the best reason to tie the knot. No, no. (laughs) Yeah. So, Ray, you're probably not surprised to hear that he was divorced within two years. And that was also right around the time that the bank had to, unfortunately, start the process of foreclosing on their home. Mm. So it sounds, it's, you know, it's the typical story of, not typical, but there's no foundation, so they can't weather anything Anything bad, anything negative, yeah. According to Ray, um, by then he had worked, and I think this is really important, according to Ray, right? Because some (laughs) of these things are not even able to be verified. Like my story. Yeah. Um, he'd worked for AT&T for nearly a decade. He began at Southwest Bell as a telemarketer, selling equipment and services. He also did very well in management for their telephone stores, leading the company to relocate him several times during the 1980s. By the, by the early 90s, he had become a trainer at the AT&T School of Business in Atlanta. So you kind of like know his back his backstory on what, what got him into being a, in a public trainer and speaker. So after more than a decade of writing and lecturing, the filmmakers of The Secret asked him to appear in their 2006 film. If you're not familiar with The Secret, and I myself remember when this was big, do you know what I'm talking about? The Secret? Okay. (laughs) You didn't see Jen, but she (laughs) arrowed. But seriously, I had several friends recommend the book to me because they knew I enjoyed reading and they were really into it and they thought it was great. The few times I tried to pick it up, though, I just couldn't get into it. It was never for me either, it just but it couldn't. was all over work. And it was a big deal, time. right? Yeah. I mean, everybody everybody was talking about it. I mean, I can picture the cover. And, um, right, so if you can't picture it, it's like an old vintage book with, like, a red seal. Like, mm-hmm. the old time, you know, seals that they would stamp letters with and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. Right? Making it look old and wise. The film basically goes into the law of attraction, a belief that thoughts become things, right? So positive thoughts attract positive outcomes. The secret promise, a dream life awaits anyone with a properly focused mind. Manifest, manifest. Yes, it made me think of you manifesting. I'm manifesting today. Yes. Manifesting. I mean, imagine that everything, including you, your home, your things, all of its energy, right? So kind of like it reminded me of like, if you build it, he will come. Because mm-hmm. I relate everything to movies. Field of Dreams. It made me think of that. And I'm like, okay, but in more of a, if you think it, it will come to you kind of mentality. So it just makes me think of, you know, he would just say like, oh, you know, I was thinking I, one of these days I'm going to get this car or I'm going to, you know, make a hundred thousand dollars within a year. And if I think it and think it and think it, all of a sudden it's going to happen. But it's that same concept now that they're saying when you write things down, you should write your goals as you already achieve them instead of mm-hmm. what you want to do. Like, I want to be right. blah, blah, blah. Or you write down, I am. Or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, because the more powerful it is when you mm-hmm. say what it is opposed to what you want. But in a, in, in, in a way, concept. I, I do agree with all of it. I don't think that... You can say whatever you want, though, but if you don't do anything about it, nothing's going to happen. You have to have action that goes along with it, absolutely. But as long as it's something that's reminding you that this is your goal Mm -hmm. and the things that you're doing every day working towards that goal, then 
yeah, the chances that you're going to accomplish that are pretty high. Mm -hmm. So James all of a sudden went from this little-known motivational speaker to a hit sensation overnight in the self-help world when Oprah started raving about it. She had the speakers who were interviewed in The Secret, including Ray, on her show, which, of course, we all know is a big deal. If you were on Oprah and you had her seal of approval, you made it. Mm -hmm. Like, that's it, right? Everyone knew who you were and what you were about, and if Oprah loved what you were doing, the people loved what you were doing. Everybody loved you. And it reminds me again of the yoga guru, and as soon as he had celebrities saying, Mm -hmm. like, this guy's amazing. Yeah, when I told you about Madonna saying how she only does yoga. Yeah. No, she was on Oprah when she said it. Well, there you go. Just funny, huh? Uh, Oprah's got to feel bad about some of this stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, sorry, Oprah. So, you know, it's no surprise that it became an overnight sensation and the book sold 19 million copies. The Secret. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. Um, Ray blew up. He started appearing on things like Larry King Live, The Today Show, Fox Business News. He was even asked to judge a Miss America pageant. Because, you know, that's what self help people do. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised I don't know his name. I know. I'm surprised, too. So in 2008, Fortune Magazine featured James Ray calling him the next big thing, and I quote, the next big thing in the highly competitive world of motivational gurus. Ray made no secret of his ambitions either. He wanted to become the first self-help billionaire. I mean, right? Like, he already had his goals set pretty damn high. However, remember when I said that Ray liked to embellish things and you make make false claims? Prior to becoming this superstar self-help guru, he was teaching those training sessions for AT&T using material from Stephen R. Covey's best-selling um, self-help book, The Seven, uh, what's it called? <laughs> the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. What's like a mouthful, sorry. <laughs> this training material was licensed from Covey Leadership by AT&T. So James Ray's website would claim in the beginning, as he started his own business and things started to emerge, that he had an alliance with the Cubby Leadership Center. Which is false. But it's false. And then this evolved a bit over time to start saying he had spent four years working with the best-selling author, Stephen Covey, you know. When really he just used the He used license. a training manual that was licensed by his other company. <laughs> I mean, that's not even close to the same thing. No, but I I, I appreciate that embellishment. I mean, he made that work for Oh, him. he did. He was like, you know what? It's I'm all gonna, about gonna, the wording, yes, people. I'm going to flip this around. Nobody's going to fact check this. <laughs> And actually, you know, what is sad is that people did fact check it and nobody cared. They're like, ah, he's a fraud. It's fine. It's okay. You keep going. You do you. It's fine. No big deal. It's just like pick on, right? Yeah. Like, you you, you tried to assault you? I figures. Uh, That's that's kind of what we thought. I'm going to sign up for his next training session. Right. This is what baffles me. This is why this needs to be talked about more. This is why. So, for the Fortune Profile, published in April of 2008, Ray clarified that he taught the techniques at AT AT&T later um, and spent two years as a contracted employee for Covey. So, he wanted to clarify that. However, a spokesperson for Covey Leadership denied that Ray actually ever even worked there. So, he lied again. I was going to say, how did he get that? He wasn't contracted by now. I mean, that you mentioned. Yeah, no, he he never did those things. <laughs> so we're seeing a we're seeing a pattern here. You're right. His resume. Just let it go. Ray. I know. Right? Let, let it go. go. Let it go. Just be like apologize yeah. and move on. That was a typo. We're I fired the person that put that on my website. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever you got to do, man. Um, but you know we're seeing a pattern. His resume has all these half truths and lies sprinkled throughout. Basically, whatever he thought he needed to link himself to whoever to get what kind of a boost he needed at the time, right? It just... He probably thought if he got the notoriety, what he could deliver, it wouldn't matter how... what he put on there, is what I'm assuming. And it's kind of true. Mm -hmm. So, while training with AT&T, he realized, though, that he wanted to go out on his own. So, he created Quantum Consulting Group and offered his services as a consultant slash trainer. He then moved to San Diego, and his company became Ray Transformation Technologies, and then James Ray and Associates. Even though group and associates, eh, that wasn't entirely true either, since he was kind of a one-man band, right? He was like, just James. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> Jazz hands and, and all. Associates. And Associates. 
Yeah. And it's just him. Yeah, it was just him answering the phone, doing the marketing, all the stuff. Let me transfer you to Ray. Yeah, let me transfer you. Ah, this is Ray from accounting. <laughs> let me transfer you. <laughs> Hold on, let me grab Ray in the logistics. <laughs> Ray, what are you doing for lunch? All right, man. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So we think we we like we think we're fun. Yeah, I'm entertained. By that. that's, that's all that matters. <laughs> I'm entertained by us. Um, he called his seminars the science of success. Right. Well, that was until the Napoleon Hill Foundation, another self-help company, <laughs> let him know that they had trademarked that phrase. They're the science of oh, success. Yeah. Now you, Ray. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on, Ray. <laughs> Hold on here. Can you come up with anything on your own? No? Okay. So, again, we're seeing this pattern, right? Ray's just ripping off people left and right, it's in bits of other successful sources, and calling them his own. <sighs> Initially, James and, and okay. What year is it now? You can't do that anymore, right? Yeah, this is like the, the internet. 90s. Yeah, yeah, no, people still know what's going on. And, <laughs> and, and and you know, discussing the whole fake it till you make it thing too. I remember this. There's like a fine line, right? Because you and I were talking about mm-hmm. a certain person. I don't know if we're allowed to like mention names no, or whatever. Probably not. probably not. But I I appreciated what she had said, which was you could probably explain it better. Well, she was just saying how doing what someone else is doing because you admire them mm-hmm. until you can get your own is from a flattery. It's not really copying per mm-hmm. se because you, you know, we've talked about this person and some of the things she says and mm-hmm. does reminds me of It other reminds people, you of a lot of other which people. Which makes me not like her because yeah. I know it's not authentic. Right. And she's become a little bit more authentic recently and she uh-huh. came out and said... I don't even know if she realized at that time what she was doing, but she was Mm -hmm. saying she pretty much copied those people until she could come up with her own because she knew Mm -hmm. what she wanted to do, but... Right, right. And I get sometimes in your niche of what you're trying to do, it it's going to appear and it's going to be very similar to other people's things as well because there's only so much there's shit only so much with. stuff, right? Yeah. There's only I mean, right. So I th- but I think there's a fine line between, you know, admiring someone and doing something a certain way because that's how they did it and just blatantly stealing their shit. Mm-hmm. So I do. Yeah. It's a very fine line. Very fine line. And especially when other people can recognize mm-hmm. Instantly. And it's not yours. And they start calling you and telling you they have a patent <laughs> on that. <laughs> a little bit of problem. You might want to learn. So initially, James's websites touted his knowledge of business and sales experience. Right. We're not surprised. Um, that's what he knew. It wasn't until after The Secret that things started to take on a more spiritual vibe. Okay. Mm. Here we go. Right now. Hold on. <laughs> In Harmonic Wealth, Ray describes taking a self-imposed exile from his wealth because... And I quote, a warrior doesn't have or need anything. So basically, you can read here, he was broke, right? He wasn't booking as many appearances. His business wasn't doing as well. He wasn't making payroll most of the time because at this point he had like a handful of employees and he was putting their their paychecks on his credit card. And this is what he was doing to try to stay afloat. Mm -hmm. And I think what I, I think I didn't put it in the story, but I think what I had read was just like the age of technology had had come in and people weren't booking him as the keynote speakers anymore because some of these companies were going under. They Mm -hmm. weren't surviving. He claims he went back to Hawaii and began by seeking out a wise kahuna in Hawaii and a Peruvian shaman. He writes his book, Harmonic Wealth, about his time there. But it's very murky. He claims that in 2005, he had this aha moment at the summit of Mount Sinai. He says, and I quote, here we go, I know, you know. Let's see if I can say this with a straight face. I was the only one there all night long, shivering from the cold on the mountaintop and hovering over a tiny candle flame. This is where it all came together for me, he writes, where the final piece of harmonic wealth and the quantum physical material that I had studied for over a decade took form for me in a kind of rapid download into my journal. In the very cave where Moses received the Ten Commandments, James had an epiphany, and it was here, in that cave, that he received his own universal lost gen. Right. Do you want to buy the book right now? That's deep. That is deep. I could could not come up with that on my best day. (laughs) Hey, man, I just had to come up with a word for, you know, for the year, and it uh, it was a struggle, but... I can't handle the theatrics that go along with that. You just need to give it to me black and white. Don't mm-hmm. em- the embellishment is too much in that one. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, and, and even for me, I got a lot of gray areas that I'm cool with, but mm-hmm. that's just messed up. Okay, Ray, I can't take you seriously after that, but let's keep going. So two months later, in July of 2005, he was invited to attend a meeting of the Transformational Leadership Council, which claims to be a group of leaders in the field of uh, personal and professional development, right? So it was at this interview, or I'm sorry, it was at this meeting that he was interviewed by Rhonda Byrne, the producer of The Secret, and also how he became to be featured in her film, which led to his appearance on Oprah, skyrocketing him to fame. So this is where we're at, right? Millions were listening intently to what this man had to say. They believed him. They trusted him. So, I mean, again, nobody must have cared or paid attention to all the fact-checking. They were calling him on his bullshit, but he just kept gaining more followers. Like, people were like, That's ah, really it's no bizarre how Isn't that it? happens. It's just, I don't understand it. I feel like right now, if you say something wrong on social media, I mean, you can be like, I had pepperoni pizza and someone sees a picture of sausage. Like... You're screwed. Yes, you yeah. no longer have any credibility across the world. Apparently, that's not true. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a really bad yeah. example, but you know what I mean. Keep that in mind, okay? So this brings us to the Angel Valley Retreat in Sedona, Arizona. This retreat was one of the highest level workshops that James offered. Many followers of his teachings who had already attended several events in the past, usually the first seminars are free to attend. You know how that goes, right? It's free. Come on, enjoy the food, mm-hmm. have a drink, listen in. And then, of course, they upsell you with books and other workshops and events, which is to be expected. I mean, come on. Today is known as a podcast. (laughs) Correct. Just not ours. We're free. We don't even have an ad. (laughs) We're good. You guys can listen to us all day long, and we won't sell you anything. (laughs) Um, I mean, again, you can't attend these things and expect that they're going to give out all their secrets for free. I get it. You know, you have to pay to attend and learn more um, and eventually get the opportunity to work with James in a smaller group setting. So the people who qualified for this big trip to Arizona were paying around $10,000 to be a part of this five-day retreat, okay? So you thought it was kind of crazy before that these people were paying 10000 to fourteen, right, to be trained in this yoga, um, the Bikram yoga, but these people were paying $10,000 for one retreat. And this, for, for many of them, this wasn't even the first one that they'd gone on. So can you imagine? Is that good? So they thought, right? So people's, uh, yeah, I mean, it might sound crazy to us, but I was always trying, I was also trying to keep in mind that these people had been investing in this man and his teachings for, for quite some time. Like you said, they thought he was that good. I mean, they were truly all into his methods to improve mm-hmm. their lives. Like some of them must've been seeing improvement or enjoying it. Right. Yeah. I mean, you don't continue something unless it's, you feel like it's good for you. They were invested. One participant who would end up losing her life. At this retreat, Liz Newman had spent over $100,000 over seven years traveling to James Ray's retreats. Wow. That's quite a lot. Kirby Brown, another that we will talk about and discuss, invested her life savings to attend this particular one in Arizona. So furthermore, many of the people that attended this event as well, and I feel like I have to say this too, they're highly intelligent, hardworking high earners for the most part and achievers. Like they were already achieving great things in their lives. Many were entrepreneurial and simply just the type of people to constantly be working on bettering themselves and not settling for average. They really didn't seem to fit the type that would blindly follow just anyone. But again, I don't even know if there's like a type, honestly, right? Like these people were just, I, I, I mean, my heart goes out to them. They didn't, They didn't, like I said, wake up one day and go, I think I want to be a part of a cult. No, they were trying, they were making an investment in themselves. They were. And I think some of the things that he would do were so extreme that people that like were adrenaline junkies or would like to push themselves past limits were like, this is amazing. This, This is making me feel alive. I mean, you have to remember that too. I mean, some of these people were looking for something that wasn't so mundane as their everyday lives. I'm curious what goes on at this retreat. Yeah, here we go. So, I mean, these people thought they were pushing past limitations, having breakthroughs, facing fears so they could do greater things. They trusted that this guy was everything he said he was, and probably more. I think it's one of those things that I mentioned, you know, that when you're really in it, you don't realize what's going on until it's too late. Upon arrival, they would be asked to immediately shave their heads on day one. Okay? No, you know something's wrong then. Yeah, right? Isn't that your, like, your red flag moment? 
That's what I wrote down. Like, that would have been a red flag for me no. to be like, wait yeah. a minute. Why do you have to shave your head? Mm-hmm. Right. That my just first, makes me angry. It, it's right? stupid. There's no point. It's so funny. That's what I wrote down. I was like, my first thought when I when I was reading this and listening into it, I was like, hey, welcome to our cult. Shave your head and have a seat. Yeah. Right? Like, no, here we that's go. like the dumbest thing ever. Like, it's like, it's like in the script mm-hmm. of cults, right? Shave your head. Follow me. Yeah. Don't have an identity. Well, what is that doing to better yourself shaving your So, I think the whole point of that exercise was to get past, like, your appearance and your, like, stop thinking about the way that you look and all like of these. Like, disregard your vanity of some sort? Yeah. Just kind of get past that and then you can, like, have a clear mind to move forward type of thing. You know, but God, a lot of these people paid a lot of money to be there and they probably find it hard to question their doubts. They're probably, I mean, I'm sure his teachings program them to think that like, okay, those doubts are just fears and you need to push past it and do what I say because it's only going to help you. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, this is what they were, this is what they were doing. Yeah. yeah. And I think this was just different than any other retreat. I think some of the I other so. retreats were extreme, but I don't, I hadn't read anything about the shaving the head. That seemed like mm-hmm. a new thing. That's very cool. So. The attendees would also be asked on this retreat to go 36 hours in the desert with no food or water. They would be asked to play a game where James would emerge in a white robe and play God, symbolically killing people, right? So, like, if he told you, like, you're dead, you had to lay down on the ground and you couldn't move until the exercise was over. And what was coming out of that exercise? Well, I think the common symbolism at this retreat seemed to be rebirth. As you'll see with the final event, it was about shedding your old self and your old ways to be enlightened and move forward, you know, with like clear purpose and without fear or limitation. Just that kind of thing. During the game, the samurai game, which is the one where he played God, some of the participants actually would lie on the floor. And these conference rooms are cold. They're not like... I. Whenever I would go to... Any type of conference, you know, a big room like this or when we were traveling, I always had to bring like a sweater Mm -hmm. because you're freezing in those places. So some of these people were lying on the floor freezing, literally playing dead in this conference room for hours. They even missed dinner. He didn't even have them get up to go to dinner. Yeah. Crazy. It was a long game. I mean, yeah, it was a very long game. They couldn't speak. They weren't allowed, they weren't allowed to, they weren't allowed to address him. So if they would address him and ask a question, you're dead. Like, he, he wasn't answering questions or doing anything. Like, you couldn't he's move. God for real. Oh, yeah. I mean, right? And then, as a finale, they would be asked to endure an intense sweat lodge. And I have that in quotation marks because, and I use this term here only because this is what Ray would call it. But it's very important to note that a true sweat lodge is a very sacred spiritual ceremony to the Native Americans. You have to be trained to lead one. There are many roles. It's a heavy responsibility to take on. You have to make sure these people are doing okay. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like this was another one of the things Ray would rip off and make his own version. But as you'll see, it's a very unsafe, not very well thought out version. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it reminds me again of your story with how the, the people in India were like super pissed about the way that yoga was being represented. Well, the Native Americans were furious. They were angry. They were... They were very upset about all of this. This was their tradition, and he just made this whole... He made a mockery out of it. Yeah. It was just awful. So Ray told his followers that this sweat lodge would be the most intense, extreme test of their willpower yet, and he wanted to see if they were willing to play full on. So he would say that often. He'd be like, you need to play full on. You're not playing full on. Like You've got to, you know, push through. And he would, of- he would often encourage people to basically... Like I said, push past their limitations, see what they were capable of, and telling people that their aha moment, you know, so to speak, was just on the other side of their discomfort if they could just get there. So people believed him. They trusted him. Almost kind of like, oh, God, I'm running a marathon. I can push past my fear. Mm-hmm. I can push past my pain. I just need to get to the finish line. And it was like that with all of the exercises. Before they began, he warned them that this final test was a symbolic death. He said, you are not going to die. You might think you are but you are not going to die. So again, these people have been conditioned, as I mentioned, by the weeks prior, spending time with James among like-minded people, happily, excitedly enjoying his teachings. Obviously, or they wouldn't have paid to do more. He kept telling them that a breakthrough was just on the horizon, right? Just a matter of time. One follower described the experience as thrilling and addictive. And many of these people truly just, they were happy when they were at these, you know, at these retreats. Being programmed to accept what he was saying, even if it was scary or personally detrimental, 
they're constantly challenging themselves to push past like physical limitations as well. And this is pretty much how it seemed that the trap was set for people, you know, inside the lodge that wouldn't make yeah. it out alive, right? There's, if you're a competitive person and you're trying to push through, I mean, well, you can't push through without like your body's no. shutting down. No, but you're believing somebody that when they tell you that you're going to feel like this, but you're not, it's fine. Mm-hmm. You're not, everything's going to be okay. And they trusted him. Shame on him. Yeah, that's. So as I mentioned, the lodge was modeled after a Native American custom intended to purify the body and spirit. They had a wooden structure built covered with a large tarp and blankets. Inside, water was poured over hot rocks, creating steam. But in this sweat lodge, the temperature rose to dangerous levels as 50 people, more than 50 people actually, crammed into the small heated space. People who would, if you remember correctly, people who had just endured 36 hours in the desert fasting prior to this. So not a lot of food and water was being consumed. They'd been taken out of their body's normal routines and rhythms, having spent, you know, four days doing all of these physical challenges, the fasting, the samurai game, the head shavings. This is what he wanted. He wanted them off guard as much as possible so it would be an even more intense, challenging experience. It almost seemed like he was... Using these people as guinea pigs to Sounds test like out. Hazing. Right? What can I think of that next yeah, that these people will pay people? me thousands of dollars to do? Uh, right? Mm. So many cultures have sweat lodge rituals, and typically tribal elders monitor sweat lodge leaders for years before they're permitted to conduct these ceremonies, right? There's basic safety regulations. At race events, now and in the past, there were never even medical staff on duty. There's like no one just in case anything goes wrong. The ceremony itself in Native American culture is a communal experience involving meditation and spiritual guidance. A round, as they would call it, might consist of 15 to 40 minutes inside a densely humid room at 150 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, followed by a cool down outside. So people were allowed to go outside, cool down, and maybe they would do another round. And it, it actually, it did say that a ceremony might involve two to three rounds. So that was normal. This sweat lodge, however, disregarded most of these rules that were usually in place. In Ray's makeshift lodge, temps approached 200 degrees, maybe even hotter, because it wasn't actually monitored. Also, Ray had this one built larger because he wanted to cram, he wanted it built for 75 people. As the days went on, people were leaving. They were like, this is bullshit. Yeah, I don't care. If I, yeah, I'm out. So more than 50 people ended up cramming into this structure where usually a lodge would typically host like five to 10 people. Um, The participants at Angel Valley had also said that even though they were shoulder to shoulder inside, it was really hard to see the people even a few to each side of them, right? So as you can imagine, people were not able to really get a pulse on how others were doing. I mean, they, they, they were probably, I'm sure it was hard enough to even monitor how they were doing. Obviously, they weren't doing a very good job of it, as you'll hear, but... Before they began, Ray would tell them to listen to his, to his or her body and that they could leave if necessary. But if you were truly seeking a higher level of consciousness, you would complete the experience. Ray told them that they needed to surrender to death to survive it. Then they all crawled in because it was so low and took their places. And I will show you a picture of this. I mean, there was no air getting out on any other side. Like they, it almost looked like they had sandbagged the tarps yeah. down, right? There was like a flap. Okay, of course, who would be seated near the door? Right. Of course, of course, James Ray would seat himself right by the door. The only ventilation was that single door flap, which would be opened every 15 minutes for a little air and cool down. One attendant, Brandy Amstel, who was interviewed, said she sat next to him because she knew Ray wouldn't do anything to hurt himself, so that's where she wanted to be. It's very smart, Brandy. Things became intense quickly. Those the furthest from the door had trouble breathing, and with each round, Ray had more heated stones added. So I didn't write this in either, but I think I remember reading that like a normal, like super hot, like one of the hottest would have maybe 30 stones. He had over a hundred of these stones. And typically they would use like a ladle to apply water to the stones a little at a time. He was using buckets to dump water straight onto these stones to create the steam quicker. And he was also using the water to cool himself. Because he's right. Yeah. Many developed breathing trouble. They said that once the water hit the rocks, the steam rolled over them, and it was like breathing fire. It was literally burning the inside of their throats. Like They were cooking themselves in this thing. 
So after a, after a few rounds, people were streaming out, disoriented. Some could barely move their limbs. A few felt like they were dying or having a heart attack. Some were in distress physically, but still worried to leave because they felt like they were disappointing Ray. It was said that it looked like a mass casualty event. Like, these people were severely injured, most akin to, like, a crash site, right? Like, a car accident. Mm -hmm. They were lying on their sides. They were barely breathing. It was scary and unbelievable. When, when asked later, they all said that Ray just kept telling people to keep it together. Um, they were better than this. They could endure it. The ones that stayed, they trusted him. They were pushing themselves. After all, that's what they paid to do, right? Mm -hmm. That's why they were it's here. Just on the other side. Just on the other side. So this, this totally makes me think of training as an athlete. It's the only thing that I can relate it to. I know it's not the same, but I can just tell you that there was many times I thought I would like die and literally pass out, but you didn't. You pushed yourself. You trusted your coaches, your trainers. You just knew it was a challenge that had to be endured. But you, I mean, you also knew they weren't going to ask you to do anything that was going to be harmful to you. I mean, they were there you watching you. You knew you weren't going to die. You knew for sure you weren't going to die. But I mean, I was stubborn and I'm competitive. And I, when I say I'm going to do something, I want to see it through. So I could totally see me being like, I got this. I can do it. I want to say that I finished it. Well, and I think you get to a point, too, that where you're so sick, you can't even move. I think you're right. Yeah. Like you, you can't even you couldn't help yourself get to the door if you, if you wanted, you wanted to. to. And mm. nobody you can see that you're in distress because nobody can even, they're, yeah. they can barely take care of themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's a point where you're just... It's devastating. In trouble. It's devastating to think that these people were blindly following this man who had no fucking clue what he was doing. He just he was, made this shit up. Yeah. He just made it up as he went along. Ugh. It's just... It's like a torture trip. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine paying your life savings to be tortured like that? And then somehow coming home being like, rah, rah, that was amazing. It wasn't... No. No. I shaved my head... Some guy who pretended like it was God killed me. So I missed mm -hmm. dinner. I slept in the desert and starved for 36 hours. I mean, whoa. Wow, that sounds like an amazing trip. I'd rather go on vacation with my family. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I think if I would have, like, missed dinner on the floor, I would have been out right oh, then. Oh, no. And I'm definitely not sleeping in a desert. Oh, no. I wish you like, scorpions or something. I would be, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would have been, oh, the first. So one of the ladies was saying that she was sitting there journaling because they were like, you know, yeah, at you're peace supposed to with mindful. nature and whatever. I mean, some people truly enjoyed that. They were like, this was amazing. It was probably the first time they'd been without their cell phones and their families for what? Yeah. To like sit in nature and actually just hear the quiet. They were probably, that probably was amazing for a while. But the one woman who was sitting there, she was said that they heard something like a like a scuffle among a couple of animals, like a, maybe a mountain lion oh, wow. getting its kill. Mm -hmm. And they were thinking, oh my we're God, next. how close is that to me? No. Oh yeah. Thank you. This retreat you really could have You can pay me $10,000 yeah. to go on this retreat. Yeah. Yes. <gasps> Thank you. Sorry. I know. I feel a little, oh. Yeah. So in court, the prosecution would later argue that the high temperature and overwhelming humidity made it impossible for the participants' bodies to cool themselves. As the rounds were on, people began exhibiting signs of heat stroke, confusion, nausea, and loss of consciousness. Like you mentioned, people were, they're passing out inside. Debbie Mercer, who was hired by Ray to pass heated stones into the lodge, she was posted outside the door. So she had a clear completely sober view of what was happening like she wasn't affected she wasn't in the lodge she could see and recount all of these things like half the people in there probably can't say what really happened they probably don't remember right so after just the first round 12 people left from inside ray was encouraging them to return ray's employees actually went to one woman and put their hands on her back and tried to guide her back in as she was like she was basically saying, like, I can't do it, but I don't want to disappoint Ray. And I can't, you know what I mean? And they're like, oh, yeah, we'll help you back in. Just go, go on, go back in. And she was clearly out of her mind. And that's when Debbie said that she stepped in and was like, I got her. You know what I mean? I'm going to take Come you over way. here. Yeah. I mean, she clearly wasn't in any shape to endure another round. And thank God, you know, she didn't let her go back in there. Other participants were collapsing at the entrance and had to be dragged away from the door. And some people inside started passing out and also had to be, like, drug out. One person on the inside could be heard screaming, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And calling out the names of his two children. Ray, seated by the exit, of course, near the airway, simply said, buddy, you need to pull it together. And then he told them all, it's a good day to die. 
That's, yeah. So in in, in an interview later, Dr. Beverly Bunn, an orthodontist from Texas, uh, was actually interviewed. And she said that Ray had abandoned them. He was actually refusing to let anyone leave the sweat lodge while the door was closed. So this is what she said. I know he said in the beginning, hey, pay attention to your body. You can leave if you want. But if you want the clarity, you have to, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So was he, was that did he do that? I I imagine that he didn't. Although he said that, it wasn't welcomed. Of course, right? Like he I don't think he make was like holding the flaps down and telling no. people they couldn't leave. But it wasn't like this is going to be open if you feel like you need to come out, right? So you can kind of take that with a grain of salt. But you know, by the end of the final round, there were and there were eight total, eight rounds of this. Two people who had passed out inside were and were left inside. Kirby Brown. 38, and James Shore, a 40-year-old father of three, who lived in the Bayview area of Milwaukee with his family, practiced therapeutic medicine and played the drums in a band. They both died from heat stroke. James Shore had actually initially made it out. He was trying to help people. He had pulled one woman to safety, and it wasn't until he went back in to try to help Kirby that he succumbed as well, and he passed out. Witnesses say they, they both lay dying, holding hands mere feet from where Ray was sitting in the structure. More than a dozen, some accounts say 18, some said 19, were hospitalized for dehydration and other medical issues, as you can imagine. Um, But on the 17th of October, Liz Newman, 49-year-old mother of three from Prior Lake, Minnesota, the woman that I mentioned that had paid nearly $100,000 over the past several years following Raider, these retreats all over the world, had succumbed to death as well after being in a coma for over a week. She had suffered multiple organ failure, and she just, she didn't, she didn't make it back. Oh. Heat stroke is a, it's a, it's a very big it's serious. Concern. It's serious. It's serious. Especially at this level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I wrote down a little bit about Liz too. I just, you know, I, my heart goes out to these people. Just, she was a computer programmer extremely athletic and didn't have any previous medical issues. So I think that's important to note too. Like these people were for the most part, they were very healthy. Mm -hmm. She was a leader of the Minneapolis area journey expansion team. One of the many teams that raised followers around the country had, and they would meet and exchange, you know, ideas on his teaching and probably try to recruit more people Mm -hmm. for the, for the retreats. Uh, Witnesses also said that Ray emerged from the tent structure, a little sweaty, but fine. Once he realized what had happened and saw everyone lying around confused and sick, he just left them. He didn't stick around to see if any of those hospitalized would be okay. Didn't check to see if the people that weren't breathing were going to be okay. He went back, took a shower, and ate dinner. And after being questioned by authorities, he later flew back to California. Wow. Oh, yeah. No conscience. Like, zero. But, But Jen, it's okay because they left a note for the participants. They left a note. And it said... Go ahead, Ray, check yourself out. Oh, yeah. It said, Ray was unavailable. He was in prayer and meditation. Bullshit. Ray was scared and he was covering his He was packing his, his stuff as fast as it's he possibly fast could and good. leaving. <sighs> Later in an interview in 2013, he admitted to Piers Morgan that he fled the scene because he was scared. But you don't Thanks leave. for coming clean, Ray. We know. Yeah, we, we Finally. figured that out. But... What a coward. What a sniveling little coward. Right. You can't you even help off. these people. You didn't even help drag them out. They were passed out in front of you, Ray. And you left them there. So, yeah. When medics arrived on the scene, they were shocked. They were over... Can you imagine being a first responder oh, to this I can. event? Showing up with that many people passed out all over the place. You don't even know where to start. That's exactly what they said. They said... They were overwhelmed. They were, at what they were seeing, people were walking around in a daze with shaved heads, My vomiting. Gosh. Right? They didn't the even know what was going on. Like, right? Oh, my gosh. oh, yeah. You can picture it. One responder said that he thought immediately that it was a cult and possibly a mass suicide. One participant, Laura Tucker, said that there was zero compassion from the first responders. They were pissed. She said it was an awful feeling, that they were all confused. They were looking for James Ray to have some answers and to be there with them. But he was already long gone. But could you imagine being a part of this? You're wandering around. You're confused. You're hurt. You don't know if you're going to die. 
And then the first responders come and you're like, oh, thank God. And they're like, well, they probably were wanting to know what was going on. Just someone to give them an idea. Because usually when you show up on that scene, there's someone there telling you this person drowned, this person this, this person that. So I'm sure they're just like, we don't know what to do or what to start because we don't know what the problem is. Like, What the hell is going on? Right. Exactly. And there was no medical staff. There was, there was nothing. But I couldn't do that too. No. You don't be in so many places. <laughs> Where's Ray the medic? Where's Ray the doctor? <laughs> who, who do we got? Ray? What, which one are you today? Ray the cook. God. Um, so one of the victims that passed away was Kirby Brown, the woman that I mentioned that had spent her life savings to be in Arizona at this retreat. Virginia Brown, the victim's mother, doesn't mince words, right? She says her daughter was cooked to death. Of course she was. Yeah, she was. That's pretty much it. That's exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. She was a beautiful soul who was drunk on life, and she had so many friends and family that loved her. She was always the life of the party, and she never did anything small. She was an avid surfer and horseback rider. She was entrepreneurial as well and had her own decorative painting business in San Jose del Cabo, Mexico, where she lived for 10 years. She was looking to improve herself even further, possibly find a life partner and grow her business, and this is when she was introduced to James Ray. She loved Oprah, and she loved... She was one of those people that saw that. Mm -hmm. She saw that, you know, she was all for giving these guys a thumbs up and how amazing they were. And she looked into it. And that's how she kind of started on her journey. Virginia and her husband, George, even attended a seminar with their daughter a few months before the retreat. I remember I had read that she was telling them that, oh, you guys aren't saving enough for retirement or you're you're not you're you're not doing as good with your money as you could. And uh, you need to come to this seminar with me and come. And so they were reluctant, but they decided, okay. We'll, we'll tag along. Virginia had spent much of her career counseling troubled teens. And when she went, she recognized the things that Ray was teaching on stage. Okay. She was, she was just well-read and, and very intelligent. And she was, she was taking in all the its and bits that, you know, he had mentioned on stage from people like Dale Carnegie and many others that she was, that she was familiar with. He was taking things and piecing them together in his presentation, things from, Hero's Journey from Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces and bits from William Glasser's Reality Therapy and exercises from neuro-linguistic programming and holotropic breathing. Mm -hmm. I am not familiar with that, but the fact that she was and she saw that he was basically repackaging all of this stuff for his own use, it, it was a little bit of a red flag, but they both agreed that it was probably harmless because they could see that their daughter was really excited about it and... She was learning these things and applying them to her life. And they thought, well, what could be the harm in that? You yeah. Know? Maybe it's not his stuff, but it's still helpful. Yeah, but it's still helpful. And he's putting it out there for people. And, you know, maybe it's for these people that need to hear it and that kind of a thing. So, um, yeah, her husband, George, agreed. He didn't see the harm. He himself is a licensed clinical social worker who counseled first responders after the 9-11 attacks. And he said, and I quote, I just thought there's a tremendous amount of ego walking around on that stage. Right, that was his take on, you know, and that's exactly... Sounds right. Yeah. So, unfortunately, the next time they would hear the name James Ray would be when Kirby told them about the Spiritual Warrior event. And then after an amazing summer spent with Kirby, after they wished her a safe trip to Arizona, a knock on the door by a state trooper came, bearing the worst possible news. So again, you might be wondering, how could these people have followed this man, right? And trusted him so implicitly that they would lose their lives. Well, according to Rick Ross, a cult intervention specialist, he said, and I quote, it could be anyone. Ray uses large group awareness training or LGAT, where a single leader trains a large group in particular, like on a particular worldview. Okay. These leaders see themselves in a higher calling than just a trainer, he said. They all have this kind of zealous, almost evangelical view of their or of their philosophy as being an end-all, cure-all for their participants, Ross said. And he also said that if something goes wrong, it's not the leader's fault. So, you know, he kind of wondered, too, if maybe he learned to talk to people and to be what the people wanted from maybe how his father was, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure he was probably a charismatic leader as well. And he truly wanted to help people. And I mean, growing up and seeing that he probably took its and bits of the things his father did and said too, as well. And I bet a lot of the people that were coming to these retreats and coming in to listen to Ray were 
probably religious too, so they could really relate to that, you know? Yeah, yeah, I could see that. <sighs> However, for Ray, this wasn't the first time he experienced things not shaking out the way that he envisioned, and not the first time people were hurt or worse at his retreats. During one retreat, he encouraged participants, regardless of training, to break plywood with their fists or to bend rebar by using only their necks. And as you can imagine, people were injured. I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but it's just no, but the shit that he asked these people to do, and they just did it. They just blindly did it, right? Um, and then in 2005, one man turned irrational and violent after spending almost four hours in one of Ray's makeshift sweat lodges. Four hours sounds like a long time. I'm sure it probably wasn't quite to the He's extent. He's probably hallucinating. Yeah. Like, your brain shuts down after a while. You can't... Uh, but, yeah, so heat stroke just can cause confusion and disorientation, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. But Ray refused to call 911. He argued loudly with the Angel Valley owner when she did so. Probably because he didn't want to bring any attention yeah, to the things he was doing. to deal, deal with it. And, of course, people probably didn't talk about it. I mean... I'm assuming that no one talks about this on, like, their reviews. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because I don't know if people would keep going. One star, James yeah. Ray. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, but that man ended up in the hospital where he received IV fluids for hours. Afterward, he believed he had an out-of-body experience from which he had never fully returned. So he just never felt like himself after that. He probably had brain damage. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. He went from a six-figure income earner to being unemployed, unmarried, Oh, that's so sad. That's so sad. So sad and tragic. This is supposed to be the breakthrough that's going to take them to their higher level yeah. of success. And it's doing nothing but destroying them. Yeah, I know. It's so sad. It's so sad. At the tri at trial, the husband and wife team, the Mercers, who were hired to manage Ray's sweat lodges, testified to the mass chaos of what they had witnessed. During the event of 2009, she said that she had told Ray that three people had stopped breathing and that she needed a cell phone to call 911. Ray just shrugged. And later when Debbie returned from her house after calling emergency services, she saw him talking on his cell phone, but there's no record of his having called 911. So he probably was calling his lawyers mm. and his other people Making and the people that were writing the note to pin on the door. Yeah. 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 A cab to come pick him up <sighs> to the airport. Right. Even after bad things that had happened in the past, including a suicide at one event, people didn't waver. They must have found their own excuses for continuing to follow him, because they did. After all, he was charismatic, good-looking, successful, but most importantly, he had credentials. But did he really? No. No, Ooh. people, no, he didn't. He claimed, he claimed initiation, listen to this one. He claimed initiation in three shamanic traditions in Peru, each of which could have taken a decade to, to gain, right, these certifications. But in actuality, he had been initiated into all three at once, along with a number of United States tourists. So his mentor turned out to be his tour guide. Oh, my God. That's really? not even real. No. That was a joke. That's like that a tour guide was like, ah, it's like, you're a, all like a gimmick, in, right? Yeah, like, yeah, a, yeah, oh, yeah, no, yeah. no. Oh, no, it's like when we take the kids on a tour Ray somewhere was like, and suddenly everybody's a cowboy at the end. Yes! Thank you. <laughs> like This is what he did. He was like, uh, I'm going to need that on a seal of approval paper. I just had to sign here yeah. and here and here. And then he was like, sweet. Yeah. It's I like am. a fake certificate. Uh, but most of his so-called credentials were obtained in much the same way and falsely made to seem legit. Like, as you can imagine, right? Mm -hmm. He was just like, ah. Bullshit here, bullshit there. Everybody. Well, and at this point, he's done it for so long that it sure he, doesn't even matter anymore. Well, and, you know, he's probably starting to believe some of the stuff he's saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, once you've said it to enough people over and over, I'm sure mm -hmm. the same people at the different seminars got the same spiel and they got the same story. So, because of several court rulings, the jury wasn't allowed to hear much of this. Right? They didn't. They didn't. They weren't able to know about his history of the issues with the other sweat lodges to think like, oh, he should have learned his lesson. Like they couldn't. They had to treat it like an that. isolated event. Correct. So after ten hours and four months after his trial first began, the verdict was read: guilty on three counts of negligent homicide. That's it. He was sentenced to only serve two years in prison, but he was released after eighteen months in July of twenty. That's horrific. Doesn't that make you just feel like... Well, this is like when the legal system 
It just doesn't work in anyone's favor. Mm -mm. No. No, it doesn't. After Kirby's death, the Browns wanted her tragic experience to mean something. They wanted it to be a lesson to others and to help people educate themselves on, you know, in areas of self, on people and what they were doing in areas of self-help. They created a nonprofit organization called Seek Safely. And I actually went to the website and looked it up and it was, it's, it's really cool actually that they're doing this. They're basically just trying to educate people who are looking for someone like this or, or trying to find someone to follow. They want to make sure that they know what they're getting into. Well, yeah, that they want the other person's. Yeah. Not lunatic. Yeah. I mean, they wanted, again, they wanted her death to mean something. They wanted it to be a lesson to others and hopefully save a life. They wanted them she didn't die for nothing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's really cool. It is really cool. I think it's awesome. And, um, you know, like I said, I went to their website and it's it's well put together. The project's core uh, is the Seek Safely Promise, a six-point pledge to provide customers with accurate, truthful information to respect and protect customers' autonomy and privacy while providing a safe environment. And finally, that these people are living by their own teachings. Like, they're not just saying, oh, you should do this, this, and this, and sitting back in there, you know, yeah. on their air-conditioned throne. Because Ray, yes. Yeah. Because Ray probably didn't shave his head. Oh, you knew he And he didn't. wasn't in the desert starving. No. He was probably sitting there eating Chipotle on the, mm-hmm. you know. On his air-conditioned throne. Yeah, on his air-conditioned throne. <laughs> Where people were brushing his hair and massaging his feet. Exactly. So, but the Browns, during their research, they found that too many other self-help gurus are running similar scams, right? There's all sorts of people out there, people. You just have to be careful. Um, there are no ethical guidelines or laws in place to ensure emotional or physical safety, nothing in place to protect against financial loss, and nothing even requiring risk management plans, right, for these types mm-hmm. of challenges. Like, you should have had a doctor on staff. Right. You should have had... This in place, like shame on you. A policy. You had millions of dollars coming in from these people. Hire a freaking doctor or nurse or somebody to monitor. Or just, uh, you know what I mean? Don't be so fucking extreme. That's all, right? Take a step back. Yeah, that's true too. I mean, yeah. 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 There's no checks and balances for these gurus. They have no one to tell them. They're just putting shit together. Yeah, they're just throwing shit out there in a package, and if it looks pretty, they're buying it, Mm -hmm. you know? And that brings me back to James Arthur Ray, who, once out of prison, started right back at it, Jen. Right back at it. I'm so not surprised. He started using the story of what happened that day, along with his time in prison, to rebuild his empire. He is now selling his new book as The Business of Redemption, right? Because that's what he's doing now. He actually said it had to happen, and this is a quote, it had to happen because it was the only way I could experience and learn and grow through the things I have done. Wow. Let's make it all about you, buddy. I mean, These deaths happened so you could learn a lesson and be a better teacher. Are you kidding me? No, but I do see these type of quotes a lot where it makes me question who came up with them. Yeah, I know. But that's just... Stupid. Yeah. He says he hopes that the public will see his return and say, I can get through challenges in my own life as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he spent his time in prison probably revamping exactly what he was going to do when he got out. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's still promoting the same ideas, plus new ones that he's not qualified for, charging a lot of money and trying to sell new books. He's now drawing smaller crowds, not the big, huge, and he's not selling out ballrooms anymore, but he's finding new ways to reach people online and through YouTube videos, right? He's doing these online classes. His latest new class that you can undoubtedly pay a lot of money for, I'm sure, is all about how he and his wife are qualified to help you with your relationship because they built their relationship through war. He met her after prison, and they've been together for the past seven years. So basically, like, because he had to endure, like, probably all the media circus and everything that, and all the stuff that went through this, and she stayed with him, you know, through through thick and thin, and now they're now they're qualified to give you marriage advice and all those. We things. know how I feel about those people. Oh, I know. I knew you would like. And Jen, I checked him out. He has over 100,000 followers on Twitter right now with those little blue check marks. Mm. People are following away. 
So what do you think? Maybe they just follow him to see how stupid he is. Maybe. I'm going to have to look in to see any other social media accounts this tool has. He has Instagram, too. Oh, I'm he sure like, he does. I'm sure he does. Yeah. I know there's people out there that is very similar to my story last week where they know what they're getting into. They know right from wrong. They, you know, where they put it back on the victim. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure. I get, I get what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, they know. Well, it's her they, fault. She should have, they, they or he, his Why would you sign up for that? Why would you stay in there? Yeah. If you're in distress, get out. Like, it's just not that simple sometimes. No, it's not. It's not black But I white. think the more, what they need to focus on more. Sure. Okay. Think those things if you want to. Okay. Go for it. But look at James's actions after the fact. What did he do? He didn't stick around. He didn't make sure everyone was okay. He didn't, you know, the things that he, he didn't even, from what Virginia had said in one of the interviews that I was listening to on the podcast, and if you want to know more about it, I I don't know, but it had mixed reviews, but I thought it was really helpful in my research was Guru by Wondry. And I mean, that was really good because I could actually hear from the people that were at the event. Like Laura Tucker, I only Mm. mentioned her briefly, but this woman was actually kind of amazing. Like listening to her talk and tell the story. She was very well-spoken. You could tell she was highly intelligent. She wanted to tell the story. I think I think for her, it was more important to tell the story from an inside perspective so that people knew what really happened and the events that took place. And she wanted to get up there and tell it as, as truthfully as she could. Yeah. You know, I mean, even in court and all of that, like... I think she was the only person that actually came up to Kirby's parents and up and just said she was a wonderful human being. I'm really sorry that she's gone, that kind of a thing. And from what they said, James has never even apologized. Ugh. This is I'm the kind of surprised. person that you're that these that these people are following. Like I have to at- see what kind of retreats he's got offered. I'm sorry. No, but I'm just real. like, I got, I have work to do, Tara. I got to look this guy up <laughs> and find out what kind of shenanigans he's got going on. Yeah. So he's still selling the same old snake oil to people who will listen. But like I said, you can sit there and make excuses all you want for the people that were there and maybe they were whatever, whatever makes you feel better. But truly look at what this man did. Look at his actions and who he was as a person. And don't sign up. He 100% does not appear to care at all about the it's all about the money and it's all about the image that's what I that's what I got out of it that is my opinion you're welcome to your own but yeah no I agree no. he doesn't seem faced by it Mm-mm. no well we have one more one more of these type of stories some sort of transformation and then we'll be on to February yeah so I'll we'll have to see. Also, I'll be, you'll be first February. I'm going to be. Mm-hmm. We should do something together for the next one because we haven't looked anything up. Yeah. Uh-oh, bonus time. <laughs> hey, well, you know, let us know what you think about bonuses. I guess but... you guys all signed up for a retreat. Yeah, <laughs> we could, uh, yeah. A nice. virtual retreat because COVID sucks. Did you, you had a week. Did you have, you have your word now? Oh, I do. Yes. My word my word for the year that I'm going to be... So this is our flip the script, right? Like, yeah. it's, we're just making it a word. <laughs> so, um, so my word is consistent. Because, you know, I suck at that. That's a good <laughs> word for you. That's I'm a terrible. good word. Yeah, I'm terrible at consistency and everything, so... Yeah. You're, you're just very chill. Like... Yeah, I just... I, I your need optimism, to, like, I'll mm-hmm. get that done, or... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I have time. It's fine. Yeah, I can yeah. put that in. And mm-hmm. I'm very last minute with dinner sometimes, and I'm just I'm not. I don't have a plan. I'm like, yeah, we're just gonna. I wing. I wing it. Every yeah. Day. It's amazing. I never know what's gonna happen next. <laughs> I really don't. No. I love so. that flexibility in you. I do not have that. No. I'm like at seven. But at the ten. same time, <laughs> if you lived at my house, you would probably be batshit crazy. Oh, I would here. die. I would not be able to handle it. Yeah. No. Um, Just like my kids would come here and be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. what is happening? What is happening? What What do you mean we have to do this at this time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, and I, again, I think 2020 made it worse. It just made it worse because yeah. now we have nowhere to be at a certain time. We have nothing. Like, everything is, we make our own time every day. Yeah. yeah. Every day we make our own time. We're like, ah, eh, let's have lunch at three. Sure. We'll do dinner at nine. That's eh, fine. We can still fit in a movie. <laughs> if it two works. Hands. If it works. By the time. Yeah, no, it's it's been out of control lately. We need to. We, like, somehow, like, rein it back in. <laughs> I'm not really sure how. Yeah, you'll get there. But that's where you come in, and I get your help, and you can help me go, okay, Tara, you need to have a plan for meals. We're going to start small. Let's plan <laughs> meals for the week. Let's figure out what we're going to do. Yes. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I could try out my new air fryer with yeah. all these new meals oh. that I got. Super excited. That's awesome. I'm yeah. excited for you. I know. I was telling my dad about it, and he started laughing. He goes, ah, kind of reminds me of, like, when the microwave first came out, and people were like, ah, this is amazing. <laughs> and I was cracking up. So I'm like, That's yeah, so you're right. true. It's so true. <sighs> but anyway. But, all right. Well, um, I hope everybody has a good week. And yeah, don't sign up for any retreats that you know are. Or do, and just take notes and report back. Like, just film that if shit. If they tell you to <laughs> shave your head, just... You gotta go. And we will uh, see you guys next week. Yeah. All right. See ya. Have a good night.